Good afternoon, and welcome to our session on managing medical imaging in a pandemic, lessons learned from providers. My name is Tom Shostak, and I am the Director of Healthcare Economics at Canon Medical Systems USA. Today, we will be joined by medical imaging providers who are successfully navigating the governmental direction supporting the public health emergency for COVID-19. On March 6, 2020, Congress passed the Coronavirus Preparedness and Response Supplemental Appropriations Act, which increased funding for the Department of Health and Human Services by $8.3 billion. These funds were appropriated to support the development of vaccines, therapeutics, and diagnostics. In addition, it provided funds for the purchase of personal protective and medical equipment, funding of Medicare telehealth services, and disbursements for individual states to prepare for any potential surge of infections. A national emergency was declared on March 13th making the first step in aggressive action and allowing regulatory flexibility for healthcare providers to take the necessary action to contain the growing spread of COVID-19. The Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services recommended that providers postpone all scheduled elective surgeries and non-emergent care. Additionally, Many state governors issued executive orders that placed moratoriums on all scheduled surgeries, elective procedures, and non-emergent care, and imposed shelter-in-place orders in an effort to curb infection rates and protect residents. These actions resulted in empty waiting rooms and imaging centers across the United States. Radiologists, many of whom are accustomed to reading a high volume of emergency room-based procedures, saw a rapid decline in case volume. And to add to everything, non-essential businesses were required to cease operations, leading to employee furloughs and layoffs, creating higher rates of unemployment across the country. As a result, Many Americans also lost their health care insurance coverage in the process. In response, Congress passed additional rounds of economic stimulus legislation that created financial bridges for businesses, health care providers, and citizens in an effort to keep the fundamental elements of the U.S. economy intact. The most prominent stimulus bill was the CARES Act, at a cost of $2.2 trillion. This bill appropriated $100 billion to the Department of Health and Human Services in the form of relief grants designed to give funds to healthcare providers with attestation requirements attached. The bill also broadened the scope of the Advanced Accelerated Payment Program from CMS, which allows up to four months of advanced payments to providers of Medicare Part A and B services. Overall, Congress allocated $175 billion in grant relief funds to healthcare providers and dispersed over $100 billion in advanced payments. Despite these economic lifelines, providers remain challenged with reconstructing their operations while ensuring their patients and staff that safety measures have been implemented to prevent any risk of infection. Clearly, we could not have predicted the challenges that COVID-19 would bring to both the healthcare sector and our economy. So now, let's meet our panelists who will join us in today's discussion. First, I would like to introduce Chris Alsip, Deputy Chief Operating Officer at Nemours Children's Hospital with Nemours Children's Health System, who is located at their facility in Orlando, Florida. And second, I would like to introduce Sandra Severe, Associate Vice President of Operations at Jackson Memorial Hospital of Jackson Health System, located in Miami, Florida. I would like to personally extend our thanks for your participation in our session today. So with that, let's get started. Each of you represent different types of healthcare provider networks within the United States. 
Understanding this, can you provide us with a brief overview of your health network and the communities that you serve? And let's start with Sandra of Jackson Health. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for having us today. So uh, Jackson Health System is the public health safety net for Miami-Dade County. Uh, we provide services to individuals who do not have funding or access to care, uh, which include um, or low uh, access, right? Individuals who don't have um, you know, steady income, individuals who are on Medicare or Medicaid. And we also provide services to individuals with private funding. A lot of people don't realize that. Uh, we have over 13,000 employees who provide services uh, throughout, the, throughout the county. We also have a partnership with University of Miami, which is our um, academic affiliate. So, you know, our territory is broad reaching. And so in serving and providing for the community, we work with a lot of our partners, uh, whether it be governmental partners, local, federal and state, uh, as well as private providers and academic institutions. Although UM is our primary, we do work with other institutions throughout the county. So that's really the breadth of what we do. We do provide imaging services um, at all of, all of our locations. Mm -hmm. uh, currently our main hospitals, Jackson North, Jackson South, Jackson Memorial. And on our campus, we also have um, rehab behavioral health services. Uh, we have ambulatory care services. Uh, primary care services. We have our Holtz Children's Hospital, for which we provide imaging. And um, lastly, our urgent care centers. So quite an expansive health system there supporting the Miami-Dade County region. Yes. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you for that very uh, extensive uh, overview. And now, Chris, if you could uh, tell us about uh, your health system, Nemours. Sure, happy to do so. Thanks, Tom. So here in Orlando, we have Nemours Children's Hospital, which is a freestanding 130-bed um, children's hospital serving the greater Orlando region. Our hospital also has an uh, affiliation or a, a sister hospital in Delaware, in Wilmington, Delaware. That is the Alfred I. DuPont Hospital for Children. Our primary uh, focus is on Medicaid population, the underserved population. Uh, our Medicaid mix is roughly 70%. Uh, so that's the, the broad um, clientele that we serve here. Uh, similar to, to uh, Sandra's operation in Miami, we, we do not turn anyone away. Our, we are here to serve the children who can't afford health care. Um, our service lines run the, the full gamut uh, from treating children at our primary care physician offices, to our urgent care offices, to all of our uh, hospital-based um, operations, which would include um, surgical services, radiology services, um, pretty much anything you would see at a freestanding hospital. So we've been in operation since 2012. We're a, a very new hospital. Mm -hmm. um, our hospital in Delaware has been established since 1940. Um, so that's a little bit about us. So, so both of you have um, have charters that are very similar in nature in in serving um, underserved populations that need access to care. It's great. Thank you for providing us with insight and and some context surrounding your provider organization. Let's move into into our next question. And prior to the declaration of the national public health emergency and the moratorium placed on elective or non-emergent care by state governors, you know, how would you say your imaging operations were performing prior to COVID-19? For instance, were you seeing large increases in your imaging volumes over prior year? Were you uh, improving access or adding additional lines of service to the communities? that you provide care to. Chris, uh, if you want to you wanna provide us with some, some insight uh, to, to your facility. So like I stated earlier, we opened in 2012. Um, so we've seen um, substantial growth since our opening, um, roughly 10% growth year over year since we opened in 2012. So we were, we're definitely seeing a sustained growth over time. Um, that had led to the opening of um, additional MR scanners, 
opening some of our ultrasound service lines at our clinics. Uh, so we were definitely starting to expand our service lines and, and our outreach across um, the Central Florida region outside of our hospital, uh, specifically looking at imaging services. Um, so definitely we're, we're seeing a pretty significant growth and it didn't, um, didn't look like it was slowing down until COVID hit. Primarily our MR and ultrasound divisions were really booming, um, MR in particular. There's a high demand for MR services, um, particularly in children, um, since we were able to offer sedated services, as well as child life services and other, other things that you just can't get at some of the freestanding facilities or adult institutions. Um, so definitely we're seeing growth and hopefully it'll start to uh, pick up again once we get back to our more of our new normal. Okay, very good. So you you are you you've continued to see growth year over year and shift in demand for certain services based upon what your your patients are seeking out. Correct. Okay, okay. Sandra and uh, same question to you. How how was Jackson performing in 2019 compared to 2020 prior to uh to the advent of COVID? Well, you know, I, I have some statistics for you I want to read out. So you, to give you just kind of an idea, um, high level of where we were, uh, prior to COVID, first of all, we put, just put in a 3T um, MRI scanner, um, something we were really desperately uh, in need of. Based on our operation, uh, we, we have about three uh, machines. Adding that gave us four, and then with our transplant services, five. So just to give you some idea, with the five machines, we were doing um, monthly 540 MRIs wow. um, uh, for our general X-ray uh, and, and portables combined. We were at about 1,100 um, per month, that is. And in our inter interventional radiology, over 606 procedures per month. So that gives you an idea. And of course, our CTs over um, 1,000 per month. So that's how expansive our services were. And not only did we do we provide services, particularly on this main campus, and those statistics I gave you were just the Memorial Campus. Uh, we provided services for PEDS. We started looking at a pilot um, sedation, uh, sedation pilots for PEDS, so that we can generate even more um, uh, business, if you will, and really ramp up our services. So prior to COVID, you know, our volumes were steadily high. Uh, we looked at our, we have, we're licensed 1,493 beds, uh, and particularly at Memorial, our capacity was consistently in the 90s. So wow. that gives you an idea of where we were and just how uh, just compact and busy. And we even during that time, uh, right before COVID, we started talking about adding, uh, M, uh, excuse me, CTs to the business. We ultimately, we still move forward. We're replacing our ED CT machine and we're adding one for IR, a dedicated one to help with that volume shift. So, you know, it, it really was, it was a lot of work. We were really busy. Our outpatient was flowing. So, you know, COVID came around, we definitely saw an impact. I, I'm curious from from both of you. So census was was pretty pretty full, pretty active uh, in your hospitals prior to COVID. So with us, um, we have 130 beds, but the newest um, our sixth floor just opened in January. So just right before COVID, we opened an additional close to 30 beds. We were 100 beds prior to that. So the timing wasn't the best, obviously, as soon as sure. we started to get up and running, COVID hit. Um, I would say prior to COVID, we were right around 110 to 115 patients uh, on a daily census. Um, so starting to get to that point where we would reach capacity. But once COVID hit, obviously, everything changed. And right now we sit around 90 on a busy day. And Sandra, you said it was about it was 90 percent at your hospital? So prior to um, COVID, we were, and so overall for the entire system, probably yes. about 87, 90%, specifically at Jackson wow. Memorial, our flagship, uh, we were as high as 96, 97%. Um, you know, so we, we tended to have meetings to really look at decompressing, uh, you know, and making sure we get discharges out 
which obviously imaging has an impact on that, right? Physicians who want to have imaging services done prior to discharge. Currently, we went as low as 50s, and then we started steadily going back up, particularly when we opened up our OR for um, electives. And so now at our peak, um, I, I would agree with Chris, we're at about 90% at Memorial specifically at our peak. I'd now like to address the impact COVID-19 had on your operations. What was the impact on imaging operations from outpatient imaging centers to emergency department to inpatient care and to urgent care centers if imaging services were provided in that type of care setting? Did sites of service stockpile and maintain sufficient PPE and disinfectant protocols to adequately respond to the community's medical needs? So with that, um, let's I'll start with Sandra on that question. Yes, so, you know, I have to say that I'm very proud of our hospital's uh, reaction to the, the, the pandemic. Uh, so once everything happened, once the, the public health emergency was declared, it was actually a little before uh, we started having discussions on what we would do. Our infection control practitioners, our medical director of, of infection prevention, really pulled it in, into micro, microbial stewardship, excuse me, um, pulled us all together. We started having conversations with our system leaders and really had to make the determination, what will we do? So ultimately, we decided to close off all electives, all outpatient procedures, only emergent procedures uh, would we bring in. Uh, for any imaging. And typically that was individuals who are already here and if physicians had um, concerns. Initially in the it, when the pandemic um, started and, and we started sort of trying to figure out COVID testing, which we, we started by um, outsourcing, but ultimately mm -hmm. we brought all testing in-house. Uh, and so we performed to date over 30,000 tests. So we were able to kind of rally around and put a protocol in place to really respond. Now, imaging in particular, one of the challenges we saw in the beginning, of course, a lot of our providers were really concerned. So we did overutilize um, some of our machines in the very beginning. You know, particularly with individuals with respiratory concerns, physicians really wanted to understand what was going on. And as we and as confidence and I guess more trust came about throughout the system, we saw our modalities go back down to only necessary use. Now, for when we did have to perform, whether it was mobile or uh, patients had to come to the the, uh, the the rooms, we practiced, of course, um, you know, uh, infection prevention practices, which included PPE. So we had two levels of PPE. We had your standard PPE, which are your masks your um, eye covering and uh, shields and, and of course gloves. Now for anyone who had COVID who needed some sort of imaging, we then went to the enhanced. So our radiology technicians, you know, they gowned up bonnets, uh, the whole nine. And after each procedure, we would disinfect and let it sit for 30 minutes. So we also had particular routes that we would transport patients who are COVID positive so that we can keep it as contained as possible. So high level, those are just some of the things that, that we were doing. And as I mentioned, uh, we, we did close our outpatient um, and non-urgent cases. Uh, but once we started bringing those back in, we did a slow ramp up 25, 50, 75 to 100 percent where we are right now. Did you have to go back and do pre-certifications or pre-authorizations uh, again for those who had been scheduled who were coming back for services that had been scheduled prior? So we did reprocess them uh, for, for the services. Uh, and when I say reprocess, not necessarily from a, an insurance perspective, uh, but more so from a, you know, ensuring that they required the service at, at the time of need, right? So if we're able to push it back, we absolutely did that and kept it as such. Uh, if authorization, I will say if authorization lapsed, then obviously we worked with the insurance providers in advance to make sure that we, we absolutely had people in the building who needed to be here. Uh, 
Uh, this included putting in screening uh, practices. So before an individual came in, we did a phone screening to make sure that no one came in who was at risk, if you will. And with that phone screening, if we needed to change appointments, we would work with their, their insurance providers or payers to make sure that we still provided optimal customer service. Chris. Same question for you. The impact on your operations once uh, once the moratorium went in effect in your state, and I think it happened on March 20th. How did how did your um, your facility your operation handle that? Um, so exactly like uh, Sanders' operation down south, we put all elective procedures on hold. We followed the orders of the state. Um, so we. We essentially were not doing anything unless it was an emergency. So obviously that had an impact on our associates because they didn't have as, um, as much work to do. Obviously the volumes dropped tremendously. So uh, we set up labor pools. So we, we have an incident command system here like other every other hospital in the nation has. So we set up incident command and um, started to get everything from supplies um, to how we would utilize our associates. We stood up our telehealth system. Um, we were lucky to have a very robust um, network and telehealth system in place already. So we were able to quickly turn that on and utilize those service lines so that we could still see our patients, not necessarily on the medical imaging side, but as far as um, the, the routine visits, the, the primary care visits and the other visits, we were able to sustain that um, to the tune of almost a thousand visits. Um, so we were able to reutilize all of our physicians and have them see patients through the uh, through the telehealth services instead of having them come into the hospital. So that was that was a huge uh, a huge uh, benefit for us and a huge benefit for our patients. Um, on the PPE side, we were very proactive. We we took a proactive approach and started to stockpile as much as we possibly could. With our partners in Delaware, we, we share all of the resources. So we were able to, sh to shift supplies back and forth between Delaware and Florida as needed. And we had um, much, much bigger buying power to be able to buy those supplies. And N95s in particular were a big concern. Uh, so we stood up a process where we could limit the uh, distribution of N95s so that not everyone was just coming and grabbing the mask. We also set up our own sterilization process so we could use a, a high level sterilization and reuse those masks. And then um, also with, with the mask shortages, we decided to move to an elastomeric mask um, option as well. And so that's a reusable mask that is um, that you can clean and they have cartridges that um, can be used for up to 30 days. So that was was probably one of the most important things we put in place because that will sustain us long term. As uh, the next waves hit, we will have um, the N95 piece handled from that perspective. As far as entrance into the hospital, we stood up temperature screening. We moved all of our registration to the lobby. Um, before COVID, we had registration set up at the point of service. So we'd have registration in surgery, registration in radiology. It was pretty much spread across the hospital. So we stood it up in the lobby so that we could control flow of traffic into the hospital and throughout the hospital so that we could keep social distancing in place um, and we could manage uh, the crowd, basically have crowd control. So that's a, just a few of the things we did. So you, you, you really were able to, you know, like you said, you had a, a, a command center that that was the control point for day-to-day -day operations and tracking of inventory and needs of different departments to ensure that they were adequately supplied and staffed to meet the needs of, of the patients that actually um, needed services during that, that moratorium. And that command center was really, really vital to our operations. Um, it allowed leaders to meet every day. We would meet at eight in the morning. We would meet again right before the end of the uh, the day shift. So typically around three o'clock we would meet, um, and we would send a message to the staff every day to give them frequent updates to let them know what exactly was going on. Um, so there were no surprises. 
I, I think it's very interesting, Chris, and in, in, in what the good point you bring up is how you were able to pivot quickly primary care services uh, to telehealth from office visit to telehealth. And and I'm I'm curious, Sandra, was your was your operation um, able to to do that pivot as well um, with your IT infrastructure there at Jackson? Yes, uh, we we were. A lot of what um, Chris talked about is is a lot of what we put in place. So I have to say that it's refreshing to know that our health systems throughout the country, you know, really took this uh, not not only took this seriously, but we had models that we all were able to utilize um, and models that we replicated throughout the country. So that's really refreshing to know to, that that we had similar practices. That includes the telehealth component. Um, we so telehealth we we had telehealth already started for some of our um, rider trauma services, uh, particularly with robotics and our behavioral health services, particularly our main behavioral health hospital was on the main campus. And then we have ancillary uh, throughout. So one of the areas is our, you know, our South partners, our corrections, corrections, I didn't mention earlier is one of our major divisions. And so we use telehealth for those practices. Uh, So once things got going, we did replicate that in a lot of our other areas, Uh, not to 100 percent, but it certainly grew, particularly for our psych services on this campus. Sounds like we could have a session on on shared best practices between health systems. I mean, it's it's amazing how you all kind of think alike when uh, a public health emergency comes into play. I mean, I think I think this is amazing. You know, hearing it from from two very different health systems serving two very different um, types of communities. So it's, it's, uh, it's very interesting. So with that, let's, let's transition to the CARES Act and uh, federal government relief. And um, what I'm curious uh, to know from both of you is were, you, were your health systems able to access any of the grant relief funds. I know that um, I believe HHS um, had $13 billion in grant relief funds for safety net facilities available to them. And um, out of that $175 billion that CARES Act and the additional supplemental bill that passed later on in April that added additional funds in the relief grant program um, for providers. And also, Considering the fact that your um, both somewhat safety net facilities or Medicaid dependent type of a facility, Chris, um, as as, you're, you're, as you alluded to, the advanced uh, payments program was more on Medicare Part A B services, and so maybe those funds weren't as helpful. Since for a children's hospital, you're probably not getting paid a lot of. Medicare Part A and B, and so um, what? What uh, relief funds was was Nemours able uh, to acquire? So with that, let's let's start with Chris on this question. Sure. So we we definitely took advantage of the um, the CARES Act money um, to the tune of several several million dollars. Uh, they were able to help us out across our enterprise. So. The money that was uh, distributed to us was shared across our both our Delaware hospital and down here at our Florida campus. Um, but that money really helped significantly, not only to help us provide continue to provide care for our patients, but also to make sure that we could continue to um, keep people employed. Obviously, um, during the pandemic, as the volumes dropped, um, the work isn't there. Um, so we were able to to maintain our work staff across our entire enterprise and not have to to look at um, FTEs as uh, a result of this pandemic. So, and to this day, we've we've continued to be able to to keep all of our FTEs. Um, So we're very, very happy and very fortunate that we were able to receive that CARES money uh, because it definitely helped. And and Sandra, same, same question to you. So I have to echo uh, what Chris said. The CARES funding was really um, the difference between us posting an eight-figure loss 
for the year and breaking even. Uh, much like Chris, and, and we're actually understanding that, you know, we need to book some of that revenue for fiscal year 21 to anticipate any additional surges, as well as to, you know, we're anticipating slow recovery when it comes to electives. So that the, the CARES funding really was a game changer for us. And like Chris said, you know, it, it, it really helped us help prevent having to look at FTEs and um, having to really get to cuts. Basically, uh, we were able to keep everyone whole, uh, whether they worked from home or they worked on site. We were able to keep everyone whole and we still have that uh, that today. That's great. It's, it's it's wonderful to hear that you were able to retain your your staff. And um, and again, you know, we appreciate all that you do on the front line in order to ensure that you know you're up and ready to receive um, these patients in the event that you know there are any surges. I'm I'm curious were were any uh, uh, commercial providers um, that you have contracts with were they willing to extend any sort of financial bridge uh, to help you weather this storm? Well, I'll say early on our, um, not just the governmental, but our private payers, they did declare early on that uh, payment would happen for COVID patients uh, and, and and COVID treatment would be reimbursed. So that, that really was quite beneficial to us. So they partnered with us. We didn't have the difficulties uh, that maybe some would have anticipated. It, they, they, the partnership was great. That's good. I know that some, some, um commercial payers took initiatives to process claims quicker in order to ensure that funds got to providers so that they could better weather the, the challenges that COVID was presenting from the, from the drop off in, in uh, electives and outpatient care. I think our finance team uh, responded in a way that uh, in terms of collecting data, making sure that we sort of cohorted our information for COVID patients in a way that really helped the private providers reimburse quickly. So as far as I know, we didn't have any major issues, but I know it was, again, a collaborative effort. We had to do our part uh, to make sure that there were no gaps. And Chris? Same. Yeah, I would say very, very similar to what uh, Sandra stated. The, the payers were actually reaching out to us proactively to work with us and do whatever they could to make sure that we could, um, that our operations would would work as smoothly as possible. That included um, expedited payments whenever possible. They, it was a partnership, definitely. Independently, each state made decisions as to how they would reopen businesses and lift moratoriums on elective healthcare services. In Florida, the governor put an end to the ban on elective care and surgeries in the early part of May. And as of the 9th, providers were again able to provide these services. How did your health system or hospital respond? And Sandra, we'll, we'll start with you on this one. Okay, so we, as I think I mentioned briefly before, we, we prepared by developing a ramp up model. Um, start particularly, you know, since we're talking about imaging, 25% of our volume would be booked initially. See how that goes. Uh, following week 50, up to 75 until we were completely open back to typical scheduling. And so that's really, and we did the same thing with our elective surgeries. So one thing that we did is uh, with regards to testing, we tested everyone who would enter the building who required some level of service, uh, whether it was individuals who really needed to come in for imaging, uh, we would do a questionnaire, uh, as I mentioned earlier, for screening purposes. Um, and if it was urgent, we'd bring them in. Otherwise, we would defer or recommend that they go to either um, an ED if it was if if their their symptoms were uh, their COVID symptoms were seemed severe, or we would recommend that they go back to their pro provider. Now, with regards to surgeries, we did a drive-through testing model. So three days prior to uh, cases, the scheduled cases, we would have individuals come in so that we could use one of our um, high volume yet 24-hour turnaround time uh, lab resulting machines. So that really built confidence for the providers and staff 
before, and actually the patients before they came in for a procedure. And it allowed us to plan well for our elective volume. And uh, we did that across the system. Individuals who had urgent needs, we utilized uh, a rapid testing uh, that we have for COVID rapid testing model, which allowed us to have one to two hour turnaround results. Because the rapid testing was limited, uh, reagents were limited, we really encouraged people coming in to be tested in advance. And in some cases, if we were doing direct transfers, we would require results from the um, transferring institution before they came in. So two, two key things walk away with is number one, we did a ramp up model um, for our elective um, cases, as well as for our radiological or rather, excuse me, imaging service. And number two, we tested everyone using two methods, drive-through testing and of course, rapid testing where required. Wow, that's, I mean, that that's excellent. Um, so Chris, how, how about you? How about your facility? Well, I guess great minds think alike because we did pretty much the same thing that uh, Sandra's team did in Miami. So we, we did a ramp up approach as well. Um, we started very similar, 25, 50, 75, 100. It took us about a month to get up to full capacity. Uh, testing was, was the biggest factor. Uh, so we actually partnered with a local lab that could do high volume testing. Uh, we did a very similar drive through service here at the hospital where patients could come and get their, um, their swab collected. Uh, and the results were back within 24 hours. We tested all of our pre-surgical patients, any patients undergoing aerosolizing procedures or uh, close contact procedures had to have a test before they were able to come into the hospital. Uh, we further expanded our testing capabilities by utilizing all of our urgent care facilities and a lot of our clinics. So we gave that as an option as well so that the patient could actually go to whatever was the most convenient location for them, um, which really helped to uh, with compliance and with um, the willingness to, to have procedures done. We tried to make it as convenient as possible. Um, so we set up a total of, I believe, 11 locations across Central Florida where patients could go and have their test, um, uh, their swab collected, and then we would send it off to our, our, rapid, our rapid lab. Um, the same day uh, testing, we would do that here at the hospital. We have three different platforms within our lab where we could do testing um, same day, have the results back within typically 30 minutes to, to an hour. Um, so very, very similar process, um, and, and it seemed to work very well, and our patients were very happy with it. I think another advantage was having, uh, having our folks work remotely and having those, um, the infrastructure in place to allow folks like our schedulers and our authorization team and our financial counselors uh, to be able to do all that work from home, that allowed us to stand up things very quickly and really not miss, miss a beat. We didn't have to bring them in-house, so it reduced the exposure to our, our staff here to not have to have people in the hospital. So it was nice to have our um, as many people working remotely on, on those jobs as possible. Um, and to this day, we have about 750 that are still working from home and can, will continue to work from home um, forever. So that's a, a permanent fixture of your, of your operation. Yeah, pretty much all of our authorization, all of our schedulers and our financial counselors um, and a, a large portion of our IT group are now working from home. Well, again, I'm sure we could have another webcast on the the changes that are taking place in medical offices or the need for medical offices with people now working remote or the expansion of telehealth services is becoming a permanent fixture of the uh, care continuum. I I think I think the future in healthcare is is going to be very interesting. In a post-COVID environment, I kind of look at at what's taking place um, with COVID as being the 9/11 moment in healthcare, where we will look at healthcare much differently moving forward, no matter what. I think you know what what you've just uh, disclosed to us is is part of that. And and Sandra, I'm curious, has that has that happened with uh, at Jackson? Yes. 
we have about a thousand employees, a little over a thousand employees still working from home. Um, it will be a permanent uh, transition. Same thing, our IT uh, medical records group, a lot of our finance team, uh, they're working from home. Like I said earlier, as we've spoken throughout this time, you'll note there's been a lot of similarity, you'll notice. And so it really shows that uh, you know, we listened to, to each other, not necessarily, you know, we spoke, but other best practices. I think we paid attention to New York um, so that we could be better prepared for what was going to happen. We actually we followed the models. And so uh, that's that's where we are today. Great minds think alike. Yes. So my last question, I think what what COVID did is it, it is it pulled the curtain back um, on on the healthcare system's reliance or dependence on fee for service payment. And and so part of what the CARES Act provided and the enhancement to the advanced payment program for Medicare um, provided those fee for service lifelines. Um, that so many providers and suppliers and physicians are dependent upon to keep operations afloat in the event that, you know, an event like a pandemic uh, should come to the shores of our country. So with that in mind, um, do you uh, foresee changes in your uh, payer contracts moving forward in a post pandemic environment? And do you see a greater shift to risk share contracts, capitation, um, value-based care and value-based care models um, as we move out of, um, out of COVID-19? Well, you know, my, my answer will be somewhat philosophical in nature uh, in that I have to say a lot of our health systems, we were, or just healthcare in general, we're already starting to look at the shift to value-based um, models, right? And population health, right? You have account, uh, accountable care organizations. So I think the thought process happened pre-COVID. This may be an opportunity to to shift faster, right? To really make that movement happen. So you know, I I I I, I can't say that COVID was the game changer in terms of thinking this way. Um, I think COVID may have an impact on how quick we move. Uh, ultimately, I think the most important thing that we we got from this pandemic uh, really is preparedness, always being ready. And, and, you know, paying attention to the data and looking at the science so that we stay ahead of it. And I think that's where, um, if I can just, you know, say we, we got the biggest bang for our buck, right? Lessons learned, our biggest lessons learned have to do with preparedness and really understanding that at any, we can't rely on systems um, just as they are. We always have to look at how to change and be ready ready to adapt at any point. And I, I think we've talked about that philosophically. We've really talked about that even theoretically. Uh, COVID made it practical. And so I think that's the biggest shift that you'll see, whether it be payer induced or you know payer models, looking at the Affordable Care Act and how we were moving towards value-based or just in our general everyday way in which we practice emergency preparedness. Okay, so so you you feel that COVID's pressed the gas pedal down on value based yes. care, it's yes, accelerated I, it. I do, and I again I have to say philosophically I don't have the data to prove that, um, but like I said, right, and and making it simple. Number one, we were marching in that direction, right? But were we really were you know we were taking our time, and I think COVID yes certainly pressed the gas on that. Sure. Sure. And and Chris, uh, same question to you. Sure. So I think if um, you look at healthcare across the nation, people that weren't looking at value-based care um, and were still stuck in the fee-for-service model, those hospitals aren't going to survive because the, the payers are pushing us towards value-based care, whether we like it or not. Um, I agree with Sandra. I think it was kind of a kick in the pants. COVID is helping to push us along. Um, here at Nemours, we in Delaware Valley, we actually have a strategic plan to be 
fully uh, risk-based by 2026, um, and that's for all of our Medicaid um, patients that we serve. We're going to take a similar approach here in Florida to be um, at least 30% risk-based by 2026. Um, but we're def we've already started that moving in Delaware. Um, so to answer your question, yeah, it's it's something that was inevitable and that we had to move towards. And uh, I think COVID kind of helped push us that direction even even quicker. So. Yeah, I do. I I I agree with both of you. I do think that that this is going to be serve as a, a larger catalyst regarding change in, in in how payment is transformed and how that will also support transformation of delivery of care too it will be definitely an interesting time over the course of probably the next 5 years um to see how our health system does move more towards these value-based models and and how providers do better manage risk and integrate all disciplines of of, of care um, into those models and how they view um, those disciplines uh, as a percentage of the weighting of the payment. So it will be um, a very, very interesting time um, as we move forward over the course of the next five years. Personally, I want to thank you both for all that you do in the provider setting and what you have done and have accomplished over the course of these past eight months. I know that your lives have been quite challenging. And again, I thank you on behalf of, of Canon Medical for all the work that you have done in order to keep us all safe and all healthy. Um, thank you for sharing your experiences and your insights today. It is amazing how, you know, like-minded you both are and your health systems both are in adapting to the changes and the changes that you've implemented uh, over the course of the past eight months. Uh, Sandra, thank you again. Uh, for participating today on our panel. Thomas, thank you for having us. It's, it's really been a pleasure to just talk about the work we've all done and really to share our, our experiences through this very different time. So thank you for having us. You're very welcome. And Chris, thank you as well, very much. Um, thank you and, and Canon for having, having us here today to be able to share our story. I think it's important that we share all of our different perspectives. It was nice to be able to hear from an adult institution and um, to be able to share uh, what we what we did in the pediatric world. So thanks again. I really appreciate the time. You're very welcome. And we, we very much appreciate your help and your support. I'd like to uh, thank everyone for attending this session. So now we'll uh, turn it over uh, for questions and answers. Hello there, and again, I'd like to thank uh, Chris and Sandra for providing us with their insights and experiences regarding this very challenging time um, that we are facing in healthcare. Um, you, you, you two are amazing and have been extremely helpful in providing us with your experiences on what you have encountered and um, I guess what you will encounter in, in the months ahead. So with that said, um, we're now gonna take a few questions from our attendees. And so this first question, I'm gonna direct over to Sandra. And the question is, have you had difficulty getting rapid regulatory approval for necessary changes due to COVID-19? Um, uh, the 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 uh, attendee said we had terrific cooperation from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts when the mobile pet CT had to be moved to an offsite location when the pad was needed for a temporary morgue. Uh, yeah, the answer unequivocally was um, no. We did not have any challenges. Uh, again, as we mentioned, everyone pulled together and worked with us quite well. For instance, we uh, were able to co collaborate 
with a team, with a couple of teams, a medical team, as well as a team um, out of Utah to bring in a mobile trailer unit in the event our surge continued and we had to take services uh, into an outdoor setting. We were able to get quick approvals from the county uh, as well as from the state to under emergency, of course, but everyone was, was absolutely tremendous. And that goes from vendors, uh, contractors, everyone worked a lot, worked very well together and our government definitely pulled, pulled out, pulled out for us. That's great. Chris, did you, did you have any, any similar issue needing, uh, to pivot quickly and need of, uh, some regulatory hurdles that had to be removed so you could maintain operations? We did not uh, experience any challenges. We we really had a lot of cooperation and proactive um, approach from the state, weekly calls um, to, to make sure that everybody was prepared. So I think that was one of the main reasons the entire state of Florida did so well with this pandemic is the very proactive and uh, collaborative approach across the state. Great. So now this next question, um, I'm going to ask uh, to both of you. Um, it's, uh, we, we are now entering the most challenging phase of the pandemic, and several providers are having to make decisions again regarding elective and non-emergent care. What is the current state for outpatient medical imaging at your facilities? And uh, let's start with Chris on this question. Sure. So currently we're still at our 100% capacity. Um, we're not, we haven't changed anything yet. We haven't received direction from the state to do so. So we're continuing to see patients as, um, as we were um, when, when all of the, um, the uh, restrictions were lifted. So we have not received any guidance to change otherwise. And we'll continue to do so until we feel it's not safe. We are standing up our incident command system again to make sure that we're uh, keeping those lines of communication open with the state and with all of the, uh, any changes that may take place, we'll be ready to act upon those. Okay, great. And Sandra? Same Sandra. here, um, not, no difference actually. Uh, we're continuing to operate as usual. We are increasing uh, capacity for any COVID patients who we may need to serve in an ICU or IMCU capacity. Uh, otherwise, business as usual, particularly in our imaging, outpatient, and um, elective surgery uh, areas. Okay, good, good. So operations are, are status quo and they're running 100% and fine. That's great. And like you had said before in the discussion, you know, preparedness is the key, you know, for, um, for being able to, you know, maintain operations in a pandemic. So with that said, um, both of you said the CARES Act funding was instrumental in providing financial bridges. And based on the surge of COVID-19 infections in the U.S., do you feel um, today that it is important for Congress to provide another economic bridge uh, for health care providers throughout the first half of 2021? Um, Sandra, what do, you, what do you feel on this? I think it's important for Congress to be prepared to do so, uh, I, I think that there's a lot of there are a lot of questions out there. There's a lot of work to be done. Um, you know, you know, there there's an, an endless pot and an endless well of money, right? So I think it needs to be thought out carefully. Uh, how who will receive it? Um, but mostly they they just have to be prepared, and um, you know, in a in of course a bipartisan manner, so that we're we're up and going as soon as that may come to fruition if it does. Okay, and Chris? I agree with Sandra. I don't think at, at this moment anything needs to happen, but we just need to be ready. Um, and, and that money, as we both stated, was extremely helpful to help us get through that pandemic phase um, and to be able to, to keep our employees staff. Um, so hopefully if we do hit that point again, that we'll, we'll receive the help that is needed. Okay. Um, so the next question is, um, what will be the path forward for outpatient medical imaging after the pandemic? Do you think that hospitals will move outpatient procedures to freestanding sites or to buildings on a hospital campus that are not tethered to the facility? So in sense, no outpatient imaging 
taking place in a hospital and maybe thinning down of the, of, of the facility itself. Your, your thoughts on that, Sandra? You know, I think it's, it's a little too early to say. Um, you know, number one, you have to think about infrastructure costs, right? To, to make a kind of a unilateral run to say, okay, for our outpatient imaging, we should look at moving it is it's, it's kind of difficult to say without all of the ins and outs. I know some areas already have it in place that way. Um, I think a lot of our hospitals, because of the pandemic, we've learned a lot of different ways to keep our visitors and our patients safe within the structure that we have today. So um, I, I don't foresee it being a rush to, I think there's more work that has to be done. And, and I think we figured out a lot of ways, as I just said, um, to make it work the way it is right now. So, you know, it's kind of, uh, once again, right, be prepared. <laughs> but I think we're okay for now. Right. So you, you, create, you create two lines of care, one for, you know, normal day-to-day -day treatment of whatever presents as opposed to a, maybe a, an avenue for infectious diseases. So I, that's what we had to learn through this and, uh, and, and building those pathways within what we have right now. So I think we are getting better and better at doing that today. Um, I think the time will tell if we're forced to really move those type of services completely to a, an, an untethered, if you will, facility. Okay. And I think we're okay for now. We figured it out. All right, Chris, I wanna ask you this question. Um, because you had mentioned the migration over to, to value-based payments. And so what do you think will be the path forward for value-based healthcare under this new administration that will come into, um, into play in uh, January, in mid-January? I, I think we will see a movement towards more of the value-based care model. I believe that if we don't do that, um, we're, we're doing ourselves a disservice because we can't afford the system we live in today. So we need to get better. The hospitals need to get better. Providers need to get better to be able to provide care that is affordable to everyone. Um, we can't continue this high cost model. Um, kind of back on that question you asked previously, you see some of the healthcare insurers now um, starting to push towards more of an outpatient care model and only reimbursing for those services. So I think if we don't if we don't proactively do it ourselves, then it's going to happen anyway. So that that would be my thoughts on on what we see coming in the future. Okay, Sandra, you want to chip in for just a quick minute? He said it perfectly. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> that 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 you think that there will be a, a greater emphasis on it under this new administration of moving towards um, greater accountability on the provider side and, and payments. Do you, you think payments will move more into, you know, a, a, a capitated type of a payment arrangement? Yes, because we have to. Uh, and and that's, what, that's why I, I agree with, um, with Chris implicitly, right? You know, at the end of the day, we're spending a lot of money, but our quality isn't moving. So, you know, and at the, it costs us not to have um, quality care. So I think this is a big push that needs to happen. I think we've been taking a lot of time in it and it's almost like a factory, right? You do, I pay, but people continue to recidiv recidivize and come back into the system. And I probably made that word up, but the point is, is that recidivism hasn't changed. So we have to plug in that quality in there. So yes, I do think value-based um, is going to be a greater push in the new year. Okay, great. Well, this uh, brings us to the close of our panel discussion today. And again, I want to thank each of you again on behalf of Canon Medical Systems for taking the time to join us and to share such valuable information with all of us today. Um, I'd also like to thank our audience for participating in today's symposium on managing medical imaging in a pandemic, lessons learned from providers. And with that, our session is now concluded. Thank you.